And now she's she starting. Uh, she's uh, doing the makeup. Yeah, and just go off at the end of the session. Like, it's a very and experimental talk. I've just okay. pulled a lot of yeah. experimental results from literature and I'm just going to show what people say. Uh, okay, so um, again, I'm talking about STM, and on the left is an image uh, of the left and the right are both images from the very spirit of the great super connector and the iron base super connector, and in both cases, they can evidence for some order of order and explain those two results. So let's start with the two great case diagram. So uh, we have the insulator, we joke, we have a non insulator, we have a metal, we have a super connector, And 
then nucleotides, uh, where we have a state, an ordered state, to understand the role of that ordered state on the signal activity. Uh, so an outline um, for the talk is to like recuperate what is the normal state out of which the supernova be arises. Um, so I'll very briefly, very briefly, uh, show some theory slides and then talk about this STM experiment uh, out of the Davis group and the analysis that was done by uh, Michael Lawler and not him uh, to discover a pneumatic state in that visco. Uh, and then I'll move on to talk about the iron superconductors and talk about a number of experiments um, exploring the relationship between the C4, C2 symmetry breaking and superconductivity. And I think with the iron based superconductors, unlike beautiful visco, we need to talk a little bit about surface, cons surface considerations. Uh, and then I'll talk about experiments in QPI, transport band structure, and more system theories. Okay, so in Cooperates, um, way back when, in 1989, uh, one of the first, one of the very early theory papers by Jan uh, Zanin and, and Gunnarsson uh, said that, okay, well, when we have a Cooperate superconductor, um, it starts off in a stoichiometric form as a mod, an anti ferromagnetic mod insulator, and as you start to put holes into that material, uh, then there are two competing tendencies. From a charge standpoint, the holes want to repel each other and get as far away as possible. But from a fin spin standpoint, the holes, um, everywhere there's a hole, there's a, a broken spin-spin interaction. So a hole by itself is going to have four broken spin-spin interactions. Uh, two holes by themselves are eight broken spin-spin interactions. But if you put those two holes together, you have only six broken spin-spin interactions. So from a spin standpoint, if you want to maximize, um, optimize your energy from spin spin interactions, uh, that would want to drive the holes together so you have fewer lost opportunities to get that spin spin interaction. Uh, so, uh, Zanin said very early on that this is going to drive the charge to segregate into stripes. So, the holes are going to uh, congregate along a stripe, and that allows the spins to gain their interaction energy. Uh, in the areas between the stripes. Now the stripes can't be too fat because then you would have too much uh, charge energy from that lost charge. But there's an optimal spacing of uh, approximately four unit cells for the stripe to form. So a stripe state here um, would break both translation symmetry because it's a periodic uh, density wave of holes. And it would break rotation symmetry to be in a stripe rather than a blob. And it turns out that the stripe and the blob energies are pretty similar, but the stripe is a slightly better configuration. Uh, and furthermore, stripes have been seen in some related cuprate materials, not superconducting cuprate materials. Uh, neutron scattering has seen clear signatures of stripe formation in related materials, which again leads credence to the fact that when these charges congregate or cluster in order to satisfy these two interactions, they like to do it in a one dimensional way. Uh, but the problem with uh, Jan Zahn and stripes and with a lot of the early neutron scattering measurements, which did so show some tendency to congregate in this one dimensional way, is that the stripes are insulated. So um, the solution to that uh, is to think about a sort of a striking liquid crystal phase. Uh, so if we look at the phase diagram here, uh, here's the doping and temperature um, proposal from and Friedkin and Emery is that the stripes uh, can, can be sort of melted. So <coughs> this one stripe would look like this, and then as it starts to melt and fluctuate, um, first it melts into a state which preserves the <coughs> translational symmetry breaking and the uh, orientation symmetry breaking, um, but is still a lot to wiggle a little bit. So that would be called a smectic phase. And then as it melts still further, it would melt into something which has regained the translational symmetry, um, but it's still lost the rotational symmetry, so that would be the dramatic phase. Uh, and finally, if it melts completely, then you would have an isotropic phase. So the difference between the stripe pneumatic and the symmetric is that um, in the pneumatic case, just rotational symmetry is broken, but there's a lot of fluctuation. And in the symmetric phase, both rotation and translation symmetry is broken. So these are terms that have been taken from the Long, long uh, standing um, liquid crystal literature and then turned into terms that we can now talk about in the context of cuprates. Uh, okay, so um, if we're going to look for some experimental signature of these phases, we want to ask the question from the experiment which of these symmetries are broken? Rotational 
rotation symmetry or rotation and translation symmetry. So uh, a while ago, um, in STM, actually a number of STM experiments around the same time, uh, some evidence was seen for some strikey type phase, um, which breaks both translation and rotation symmetry. So for example, uh, here's someone showing the uh, that in a magnetic field, this is in a set of tests in a magnetic field, the vortices, if you see these objects here, have these little checkerboard structures inside the vortex. So it seems like possibly the vortices are stabilizing some kind of a static, stripy state. And if you take a Fourier transform of this, because the translational symmetry has been broken within this vortex state because of this checkerboard structure, you get extra peaks in the Fourier transform. So this is the Fourier transform, the grad peaks are the periodicity of the atoms, which are hard to see in this contrast because the vortices are so dominating. Why do you call it sprite and not simply chart density with four periodicity of four? Uh, that's a really good question. I have absolutely no information about spin, so I can't, you're right, but it, it's a very strong claim for me to say that there is any stripes here. All I'm saying is some kind of charge density. The reason that the word strike <coughs> came up is because there was a simultaneous paper by Bella Lake which showed the vortices were stabilizing a spin density wave. Uh, so because it, it, it was the um, the coincidence of those two papers at the same time which led, led us to talk about the word strike. But even if you know something about the spin, uh, about the spin behavior, the, the use of the term stripe implies a one-dimensional structure, which is not necessarily the case. Yeah, this is checkerboard. In fact, the title of this paper was checkerboard.
time of precision, we have to make sure that we don't get any bumps or jiggles from you know, your lab mates sneezing next door <coughs> or the germs, otherwise you crash the tip into the sample. Um, and we also want to make sure that there's no thermal drift so that when we scan over the course of 48 hours, the lower left-hand corner of the image matches up to the upper right-hand corner of the image 48 hours later. And uh, at this zoom, you can see that it's almost perfect, but there's some blurring, in particular at the edges, where the tip um, is, is doing, where the piezo is turning around in its trajectory, there's some creep or relaxation in the piezo which controls the position of the tip. And so you get some kind of a warping of the data. And in fact, there's a very slow warp as a function of time from here to here, which you can't even pick out by your eye. And it's that warp, that imperfection of the periodicity, which is just due to a boring experimental, um, a boring experimental fact, that's what's blurring out the Bragg peaks in this image here. Um, because as the, as the map is warping between here and here, that periodicity is not exactly perfectly uh, 3.83 angstroms throughout the field of view. Um, so because of this slight warp, the Lawler Kim idea to look at the real part of the bright piece is challenging. And what needs to happen is there needs to be some way to drift correct, to correct for this very slow warp, to collapse those bright peaks onto a single pixel so that the real parts can be So uh, last summer in uh, Nature, Lawler and Kim and Davis group published uh, their algorithm for actually correcting this warp in the atomic um, periodicity. And I think this is brilliant because it allows just a whole new realm of STM studies now that we can actually align uh, pixels from the beginning to the end of the image. We can start to look at subunit cell properties of the resolution that had never been achieved before in STM. So, uh, so what this algorithm does is it gets the local phase of the atoms, essentially by a spatial lock and amplifier technique. So, any experimentalist here, you know what a lock and amplifier is. A lock and amplifier um, extracts the phase of a signal in time um, at a particular frequency. So what uh, Lawler and Kim did here is they used the same concept as a lock and amplifier. They multiplied the image by a cosine and a sine with the known atomic periodicity, and were able to extract the local phase of the atomic periodicity. Uh, so it's essentially taking a local 4 component and getting the phase. And then once they have the phase, they know the exact displacement of each atom from its perfect position, and they can compute a, a real 4 transform, not just a fast 4 transform, but a full 4 transform with the actual true atomic position that they got from the phase. Uh, and that allows them to do a correction. And you can't even see it by eye uh, in the real space image, because this looks essentially perfect. But when we take the 4 transform to this image before correction, the Bragg peaks are blurred out. There's a zoom on those Bragg peaks. Um, but after correction, if you look closely, you can see each one of these red lines really does line up perfectly with Adam's entire, entire way across the image. And the Fourier transform of this corrected image collapses the Bragg peaks on a single pixel. So now the components, the real components of those Bragg peaks can actually be compared meaningfully. Whereas here, when these phases are varying across this blurred Bragg peak, the components can't be Okay, so um, what so what they did with that technique now is to uh, correct the density of state image, and they looked at the um, the real part at the qy Bragg peak minus the real part at the qx Bragg peak of the density of states as a function of energy, uh, and. They actually, there's some normalization in here. This Z just means that they divided positive energy by negative energy in order to get rid of the matrix effect. But really, uh, you should think of this as just the real part at, at QX, at the QX bright peak, minus the real part at the QY bright peak with some normalization. And if they plot that locally, they find that it always takes the same sign throughout the entire field of view. Uh, and here they're showing that the QX peak is always less than the Q, it's always greater than the QY peak throughout the entire field of view. And, uh, and they went on to do something which is a little funny because of the normalization that they use. But they claimed that the coherence length of this uh, pneumatic sign is increasing up to the pseudo-gap energy, and in particular at the pseudo-gap energy, at the 
energy of the state that we're trying to figure out what it is, they claimed that the uh, coherence length has diverged to be greater than the field of state. Um, and I would say that there's, I, I would insert some caveats into this technique. Um, I would say that there's, there's a lot of systematic effects that could possibly influence this. Um, but I think that the real brilliance of this paper was to introduce this algorithm which even allows this comparison to take place. Um, and so you can take what you will from this, but I'm presenting an experimental result that uh, the claim is that there's some tendency towards a pneumatic ordering, towards one bright peak being greater than the other bright peak, and that that tendency is uh, particularly strong at the pseudo-gap energy. And so the claim of this work is that this pneumatic order, this rotational symmetry gradient, is what's actually responsible for the pseudo-gap state. Um, yeah, Peter. So I didn't quite understand the nature of the caveats you were given, and, and you don't need to go into detail if it'll take too long, but do they affect the... Uh, the, the fact that the maximum of the signal is occurring at the pseudo-gap energy? Yeah, actually that's another caveat that I would say. So when you take the Z-map, you're dividing the positive energy by the negative energy. So by definition, you're going to get flat at zero energy, and you're going to get something very small at plus one and a little bit bigger at plus two, because the density of states is continuous, right? And so if you're dividing something small by something small, those two are very nearby in energy. Since the density of states is continuous, they're going to be very close together and you have a very small signal there. And as you move away from zero energy and you divide density of states of larger energy divided by density of states of negative larger energy, then you're just going to have a bigger signal. And so some of this uh, increase for the pseudo energy is reflecting the normalization of the <coughs> shows. Uh, because th there's, there is something pretty strange about this, right? Do you really expect that the domains are going to flow this much from energy? Yeah. So just an easy question, like, why did they take this Z? Uh, so S2 has a matrix element which has to do with how far away the tip is from the sample. Um, and it's, uh, this is one of the dirty secrets of STM, is that the distance between the tip and the sample is not very well controlled. We have to use some mechanism in order to set the distance of the tip from the sample. Uh, and there's no absolute measure, oh, I know exactly where the sample is, I'm going to move up 2.3 angstroms or something. So what we do with an FTM is we try to map a contour of constant integrated current, or con constant current. So the way STM works is you've got a tip and you've got a sample, and we require that the tunneling current, current stay constant at a fixed voltage. So say we apply a bias voltage of 100 NeV or something. And then we require the tunneling current stay constant when we move the tip in and out to maintain that fixed tunneling current. And so at any given location, really the only measure that we have of where the tip is is that it's a contour of constant tunneling current. And that's not necessarily a contour of constant height above the surface because the tunneling current itself depends on the density of states, which can vary quite a lot. So the, the tip sample distance is quite different, actually. It's kind of a dirty secret, but it's changing a lot as you move the tip across the surface. And um, so that's going to artificially inflate or deflate the measured density of states. But what you can do is you can take uh, at a particular location where you fix the tip at whatever distance, whatever unknown mysterious distance it is, if you then divide density of states at one energy by density of states at another energy, you're at least dividing out that distance factor. What you're left with is mysterious in its own way because it's the, the quotient of two different densities of states. But at least you've gotten rid of this distance factor. So this Z here is that normalized value where you're getting rid of that distance factor, but at the expense of introducing this other strangeness of uh, dividing one of those data states by another, which is kind of a nonsensical thing to do, actually. If I remember, uh, if I remember the, uh, the, the large homogeneity of the surface, yeah. and if there is a large homogeneity of the surface, it means that the pseudo gap is varying for the for the long Yeah. So how do you take into account this thing? I mean, uh, okay, you're so only, only picking the parts which are on the right. The right, left. right. That's another strange thing about this paper. So uh, so what they did is they looked at the local value of the pseudo gap and they rescaled the energy. <coughs> so at every point in space they have a spectrum. And and then they look at the local pseudo gap energy of that spectrum. So they get, I don't think it's worth doing on the lights because I'm just going to scribble on the but.
They have a spectrum. And they rescale the pseudo-gap energy. So they essentially squish or stretch this spectrum in this direction. So the pseudo-gap energy lines up at the same energy everywhere in space. And they did that before they did any of this analysis. So they, they normalized everything homogeneity. They locally rescale. So that would mean that they might be the same everywhere and don't care about the energy of the pseudo so that's what they're claiming. I, I am really abusive of this. There's a lot of caveats that they are saying. Pro prob probably you can demonstrate to whatever it is. Um, so I just, in answer to further to your question, this axis here is not energy. It's a little, little use of the scale energy. Scale the so it's one. That's the uh, I think that this by itself is not a crazy thing. Um, but, there's, but there's a lot of like, you know, I, I think you can justify almost every thing that was done in this paper individually, but then you stack them all on top of each other and it becomes a lot of things to do with the data. You know, we have been working quite a on the Southern Gap, but what we would like to see is a clear thing which gives a clear concept. Mm -hmm. And everything we see is a big manipulation of data. So, um, so I will say that I've, I've done this on my own data, and I, um, when I don't rescale the smooth gap energy, and when I don't take this Z map, I do still see an nematic state like this. However, there's an additional caveat, which has to do with the drift of the tip with respect to the sample, which is something I'm still working on, and I haven't ruled out artifacts from that. So, so I think that this doesn't qualitatively change the answer. You still see the state. And you still see the state if you take the Z map or you don't take the Z map. The thing that I'm most worried about is this sample drift business. But I think that, oh, please, okay. So I think that the brilliant aspect of this paper was this outcome. So let me move on. I'm unfortunately that took too long. Um, so to, to talk about iron based superconductors, um, the surfaces of these materials are a problem. The 1111 materials are totally uh, worthless for STM, although they have beautiful cleaves and beautiful surface states. Um, these are surface states, not bulk states, because the, there's a polar catastrophe of the surface here. Uh, the 122 materials look ugly when you cleave them. You can get sort of quasi atomic resolution like things, but um, many different manifestations, and they look different depending on cleave, cleave temperature, etc. Um, and it's not clear which is the surface, whether it cleaves with the barons on the surface or the arsenics on the surface. Um, in fact, to preserve uh, charge neutrality at the surface, you would expect that half of the barons would go one way and half of the barons would go the other way, uh, which would then possibly explain why the surfaces look so terrible, because you've got half of the barons choosing to be wherever they want to be, um, not in a perfect lattice. Uh, and in fact, there's actually a big controversy in the field between the, the people who think that there's half barium, uh, and there's another group of people who believe that the surface is arsenic. To me, this is a little bit crazy, because arsenic on the surface would be the surface would be charged, and it wouldn't be anything like the bulk. Yet we see clear superconducting gap signatures, we see clear vortices, we see many clear signatures of a good superconductor. Um, and in fact, all of those signatures are totally independent of the configuration that we see on the surface. Each one of these configurations gives us something that looks like a good superconductor with the expected bulk gap values. Uh, and there's additional supporting evidence for this from other probes. Um, so the point is that we've got half barium. And the, the, the most important thing is that in all configurations of this barium, unless the surface corrugation is huge, uh, we see the same superconducting gap signatures and it behaves bulk like, even though it looks visually ugly. Uh, the 1 1 surfaces are beautiful and charge neutral. And the 111 surfaces are also beautiful and charge neutral. So, in conclusion, uh, out of these four different subfamilies of materials, um, these guys are ugly and they have some structural reconstructions which are visually distracting, but they behave like bulk superconductors with surface state from theory and from ARPES appears at minus 200 MeV. So, near the Fermi level, near the, where the superconductivity uh, state is happening, um, we can study them even though they're visually a little bit ugly. Uh, and the 11s and the 111s. So here's a study of the 122 material, which has this sort of ugly reconstruction on the surface, the two by one reconstruction of half of the uh, calcium atoms. Um, but the question is, can we then extract from that anything to do with the bulk anisotropy of the material? And in fact,
fact, this two by one reconstruction is oriented diagonally to the ferromagnetic direction and the anti ferromagnetic direction. So it really should be able to be decoupled. Uh, so the first thing that the Davis group noticed is these very subtle, which is stretching a little bit, these very subtle uh, lines in this direction, which you can hardly see by eye. But what they did is they took an autocorrelation, and when they autocorrelate um, the, the uh, density of state signatures, they get rid of the surface reconstructions, and they just autocorrelate the density of states, and they see these objects, which are eight unit cell um, apart, eight unit cell size. Uh, and um, they also were able to find the cobalt atom with a different energy. So now they can do a quasi particle interference experiment and map the density of states. Um, the Fourier transform of density of states is a function of energy. And what they find is that there are uh, the, the quasi particle interference is dominated by two peaks, um, which disperse as a function of energy. So these white peaks here are moving closer together as a function of energy. These two move closer and closer together. And yet there are these shadow bands out here in the wings, which are copying what that center band is doing. So if you plot that as a function of energy and uh, QA and QB, what they see is a dispersion along the QB axis. So this wave vector is changing along the QB axis. It's shrinking as you go up in energy, just as you see here, shrinking as you go up in energy. But then a copy of that is occurring uh, eight unit cells, what corresponds to eight unit cells away in K space. So it's like there's two shadow bands that are copying the main band, which disperses only in one direction. So the claim of this paper is that there's a nomadic band here which disperses only in a single direction. Um, and they did some careful work to show that this is a bulk effect on the surface. Right? Excuse me? Yeah. So why do they call it nomadic if it's in the broken symmetry set that translational? <laughs> yeah, so that's the point. Um, I'm getting there. So uh, let me get there in a couple slides, okay? So um, for a long time, it was hard to do this kind of measurement because the materials are very twinned. When you grow them, they have orthorhombic domains going this way and this way uh, in very small areas. They're separated on a micron scale. And so it was very hard to get information about the anisotropy of the material when it was twinned on the micron scale. And that's why STM was the first experiment that actually showed anything about the anisotropy of the material. Because STM could look locally within a particular orthorhombic domain. Whereas both uh, experiments like transport or even ARCOS with 100 micron squad size would have a hard time accessing that native anisotropy that would be averaging over the different orthorhombic domains. So uh, around the same time, the Ames Iowa group and the Stanford group found a way to detwin the crystals with some kind of a gross mechanical uh, pressure. And uh, beautiful results from the Stanford group um, found that the transport was anisotropic. Um, and in particular, the uh, resistivity along the B axis was greater than the resistivity along the A axis, which is strange. The B axis is the ferromagnetic axis, and the A axis is the anti ferromagnetic axis. So these guys are seeing a transport anisotropy, which is counter to the naive expectation that you would have better conductivity along this axis. Uh, and to answer your question, they also looked at the, uh, the difference between the A anisotropy and the B anisotropy. And they found that that difference um, were, was essentially amplified right in this region here between the upper transition is the, um, the structural transition. And the lower transition is the anti ferromagnetic transition. So the upper transition, the structural transition, it breaks rotational symmetry. And the lower transition breaks uh, translational symmetry, because the lower transition is the magnetic transition, which, in which it becomes an anti ferromagnetic. So if you ignore the red spins here and you look just at the shape of the crystal in the orthorhombic state, in this sliver between the two transitions, that would be a nematic. Whereas once you go below the magnetic transition, then you've broken translational symmetry because no longer stirring. Is that the question you were asking? Yes, but the, the paper you should have discussed before, they were clearly in the, in the magnetic state. Yeah. So, right, that was an objection that was raised to that paper. Um, I think that, I think that to be honest, I mean, that's a, you can ask the question about the, the use or the misuse of the word in math, but the claim.
claim that was made is that there are one dimensional things. And whether or not they want to call it a or not is a linguistic issue, and then the, there's an experimental issue of whether or not there are one dimensional bands. And you can question each of those two separately. I think those are two separate questions. So, um, use of the language versus physics claim. Okay. So the band structure of the dead vessels group uh, does show some sort of nested sections of Fermi surface in the calcium electric tube material. And in fact, the nest of the Fermi surface, these short sections of bands, so I wouldn't call these pneumatic bands, it's just short nested sections of bands. Uh, and this nesting vector does match the dispersing wave vector seen by the Davis group. Um, but this band structure doesn't necessarily support the idea of a pneumatic band, it's just a short nested section of a band on the Fermi surface. Um, but it does quantitatively match the dispersion seen by um, band theory, so here's a, you know, Mason and others, many people objected to the use of the word pneumatic in the Kelsey Lunchy 2 paper. Um, but the other thing that Ibar Mason addressed was um, is there a pneumatic, is, is there actually a one dimensional band, whether or not you want to call it a pneumatic? Uh, and Igor made a claim that you can qualitatively reproduce the QPI um, without a pneumatic band. Now, this was a qualitative. Uh, because he didn't take into account any anisotropy of scattering. He, he looked um, only at the anisotropy of the band structure itself. So there is some supporting evidence from other experiments for some kind of broken symmetry in the uh, orthorhombic state. For example, the um, Chief and Shoes group showed that the vortices themselves are anisotropic. Here's the twin boundary, and here are some vortices on two sides of the twin boundary. And he's showing that the vortices have a coherence length which is about a factor of two different along the two axes of the crystal. Uh, so this is again in the low temperature orthorhombic magnetic state. Uh, and the claim from this group, uh, let's see, I'm, just, I'm out of time, so I'm just going to skip this, but I wanted to get to this at the end. Uh, so the, the Davis group has rethought, I think, this idea of the thematic band and is looking now not just at the band structure, but also at the scattering. So any kind of transform measurement or QGI measurement is gonna reflect not just the, the native band structure, but also the scatterers, which cause the, uh, the QPI or the scatterers which cause the transport. So further work that I think is is now looking not just at the band structure, not just at the QPI, but also at the scatterers which might cause that. Um, and they had previously identified the locations of the cobalt atoms, um, and they had also identified the existence of some kind of mysterious dimers. Uh, and hadn't, there's, there was some assumption that those two were linked, but there wasn't proof. And what they have done now uh, in this unpublished work, uh, which I probably should have talked about, but I think it's interesting, um, is they, from the, the locations of the known cobalt, which are marked with character axes, they uh, took an average of the little density of states around each of the known cobalt locations and came up with this strange diamond-like structure with exactly the wavelength that their uh, the, the, the QPI shadow bands would suggest. And when they did this again at random positions, not at the known cobalt locations, they got them. So this does support the idea that there's some kind of a dimer at the cobalt sites. And this dimer is obviously highly anisotropic and is going to influence the scattering. Uh, and in fact, there was this mysterious result from transport that the transport anisotropy went the opposite way that you would expect from a naive ferromagnetic and diferromagnetic direction. But if you throw these scatterers into the picture, because these scatterers themselves are so anisotropic, that resolves the issue of the transport experiments going the wrong way from the naive expectation. Um, and I just wanted to point out, this is I think the last slide, that the impurities at the Iron sites can occupy two different uh, two different locations. We know that because there's two irons per unit cell, and um, they can be oriented in two different ways. And you can see this in many different materials. These impurities are little dumbbells, and they orient in different ways. The little dumbbells are the selenium atoms with the um, arsenic atoms on top. And in particular, if we zoom in here, you can see that on this side of the orthorhombic twin boundary, the dumbbells, at least it's easier to see here, you can orient dumbbells in either way on either side of the twin boundaries. These little yellow ones are the little dumbbells that ran either way. However, on this side of the twin boundary, 
they always make the large structure oriented in this direction. And on this side of the twin boundary, they always make the large dimer type structure oriented in this direction, irrespective of the physical orientation of the substitute atoms. So there does seem to be something going on, which is anisotropic demand structure, which is creating anisotropic scattering, um, which respects the orientation. So in conclusion, uh, I think that in both integrates and iron superconductors, there's some tendency towards C4, C2 symmetry breaking, but a lot of details still need to be understood to really verify this. Thank you. Seven minutes for questions. Well, you were saying that you're going to explain, or at least that was in the title, um, structural uh, phase transition and why is it happening in the mid Where did I get it wrong? Um, so, the phase transition is the one that so why is the structural transition happening? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not a theorist. I know that there are theories which say that there is some tendency towards magnetic ordering. Um, and there are two magnetic sublattices and they can order at a higher, or at least fluctuate at a higher temperature. Um, and then when those magnetic sublattices uh, order amongst themselves, you can get a structural transition. And when they order together, then you get the magnetic transition. That's a theory that So, um, in the Davis experiment that you um, presented to us at the end, I, I think, from our point of view, the most likely uh, explanation is that each cobalt atom which substitutes for an iron creates a uh, highly anisotropic state around it in the magnetic phase, and whose orientation is determined by the local magnetization. And, and Lex Kemper showed this quite nicely with an ab initio calculation. Um, but you showed now a slide of several materials, and I'm wondering, um, some of the physics seems to be the same for many materials, uh, even if they're not in the magnetic phase. Is that right? For example, the iron selenide is not magnetic, right? This is in the structural orthorhombic phase, for sure. Right, so but that's a, yeah, typically a very... Well, There's no strike uh, in that system, right? I, I'm not. But it's okay. Sure. So uh, Sorry. I mean, structure itself is of the wrong sure. Thing, right? Sure. So you do expect yeah. that the dispersion to be on isotropic. Right, but I'm, of the structure I'm trying to address the question that was asked earlier. It's not a trivial. It's it's precisely not a trivial effect due to the magnetism. It has to be due to pneumatic fluctuations in that in that region. Uh, I would say in the in the this lat narrow. Uh, but I'm not sure how you right? can distinguish between the you know spontaneous pneumatic fluctuation from the orthorhombic structure transition. Which one comes the No, absolutely. Yeah. It's just a symmetry break. So it's the same thing. It's external symmetry breaking. It's not tetragonal symmetry starting with. Um, I guess I guess what I, I wanted to ask was was, uh, were all of those pictures taken at the same energy? Were they taken at a particular resonant energy associated with the, which uh, the right, iron, which they no, were... I just lumped everything together, and I didn't keep trying to know what came from what energy. Okay. I could go back and do more carefully. Um, I think that my guess is that all of those pictures were taken at the energy, which was beautiful, and not necessarily the same energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I mean, can one do some similar analysis in the tetragonal symmetry? Because you can just move to the <coughs> those, uh, transport in the tetragonal. I mean, if you look at the young fishes, the central yeah. group, the anisotropy matches exactly at the structural transition. Uh, no, the anisotropy sits in above the structural transition. So it's below, it's, it's a magnetic transition? Yeah. yeah, so even above the structural transition, there's this pneumatic tendency. And that uh -huh. was shown also by CX Chen that the anisotropy in the band structure is already starting to set in above the structural transition. But that, 
is associated with some externally applied strain. Yeah, right, right. So, so the externally applied strain is stabilizing the fluctuation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, those are just fluctuations around the transition. Yeah. Right, right. So it's bound to that transition. Yes. Right. So the above and the sample is clay. It's a mm -hmm. mass. Yes. Right. I see it. So, so right. The, the sample strain is not necessarily the transition strain. Right. 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 The sample behave as it's supposed to behave in the diagonal sample. So there's no an X and Y equivalent. I guess that's hard to answer because you don't get the answer unless you were to do this ugly thing. Mm. I disagree, but okay, that's a good question. I'm oh, sorry, maybe I didn't understand your point. No, no. Well, when the sky is blue, in the blue region, there's no anisotope. And that's the diagonal phase. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the point so. that they, uh, they were highlighting is this region here above, above the structural transition where there is already some anisotropy. And the point is, yeah, the, the symmetry is broken by this big ugly thing. But if the symmetry weren't broken by the big ugly thing, you couldn't do the experiment. But even with that big ugly thing, you expect fluctuations close to that transition that are measurable. That uh, heat capacity can see okay. in in exanthropy. It's a lambda point, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you expect, due to this low energy fluctuation, some effect on transfer. It's worth mentioning. So it's an expected effect. That's very different. Yeah. Okay. Can we go back to the uh, cuprate, this uh, Michael Oller's uh, analysis? Yeah, that one. So how do they measure the pneumatic coherence length? In the sample, the pseudo gap is unisot or, or inhomogeneous. Yeah. It's a length scale associated with it, but the length scale is, uh, in terms of pseudo gap, is already inhomogeneous. Yeah, I think so I'm not sure how they do that. So uh, how the exact formula they use to measure this, I don't remember, but <coughs> Qualitatively, visually, what's going on is you can see that if this this is the e equals one, little e equals one. So this is where everything is going to be scaled to the pseudo gap energy. And since this is the difference, it's the sign that matters. The difference between the strength of qy and qx. And what they're claiming is that that sign is the same throughout the entire field of view. So qualitatively, they're saying, okay, the coherence length has got to be bigger than the field of view. Whereas if you looked at this at a lower energy, which unfortunately is not in my talk then you would find some purple and orange blotches mm -hmm. throughout. And so their claim would be that in that case, the coherence length is set, at least qualitatively, by the size of the purple and orange blotches here. Uh, but the, it's a little suspect because at low energies, this Z map kind of loses its meaning. Mm -hmm. And also the pseudo gap in homogeneous gets you know, bigger in the uh, low energy scale. I'm sorry, can you just say that one more time? So, I'm just wondering, like, uh, you know, when they do this, uh, this one is the one of the one of the things that are high frequency, right? So if you go to the low frequency, which you are not showing, yeah, that the uh, the Mari, let's say, island is getting smaller. That's yeah, what right, they're right. saying, and that the size of island is mm, sort of telling us the Mari coherence length. But is that at the same time that the pseudo gap in homogeneity gets wider? Like the pseudo gap, we know as well as the high PC gaps. I mean, all of these gaps are fluctuating widely in a space. But this is so one not sample sure. on one surface, and so the pseudo gap is doing what it's doing. Okay. And then the, the energy that you're talking about is the energy of measurement. Right. So the pseudo gap is what it is at a particular location in space, and then you can measure at a, at a range of energies at that location. So I don't think I can understand your question. I'm just wondering distribution of the pseudo gap. Oh, the distribution of pseudo gap has a length scale of two or three nanometers, mm -hmm. and uh, and so this has been scaled on a length scale of two or three nanometers. Every two or three nanometer patch has been scaled to another energy. So that's essentially taking the spectrum and squishing it or expanding it so that these peaks line up everywhere in space. And then at this particular energy, little e equals one, where those peaks line up, they've done this math. And then if they go and they look at another energy down here, they see the purple and the orange in the same. 
in a simple language, can we just understand this as a density um, or orbital ordering between px and py then? That's how they choose to understand it. Okay. So n, okay, fine. But it is strange in that case. I mean, why would you think that they would be ordered at one energy yeah. and, and then not ordered and then ordered again? I don't know. I think we have to stop here, right? So let's thank uh, Jenny.